That's hard to follow. <laughs> and the first thing I'll do, of course, is to disappoint uh, Father McAuley is to change the title of the talk that he gave me, <laughs> which was to be something to the effect uh, about the, the poetry, the music, majesty, things like that, of the traditional Roman mass, but I'm going to change it slightly to say poetry, music, blah, 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 of the traditional Roman requiem mass. So I'd, I'd like to talk about the requiem uh, for a number of reasons. One, because it is such a jewel and so unknown to many people. Now, you will be relieved to hear that I speak to you today not as an expert on the liturgy or as a liturg liturgist. Relieved to hear this given the fact that a working definition of a liturgist is someone that is sent to any community which is not being actively persecuted. <laughs> I like that definition of a liturgist. Instead, I'm speaking at the invitation of my friend Father McElwee, and as an amateur, and the word amateur yeah, is a French word, and it means lover. I love the rite of St. Gregory. I love talking about it to anybody that will listen. But I wish to change slightly that title to the Requiem Mass, but before speaking specifically about the Mass, I wish to address briefly a grudge in our times against things traditional. And I'm going to use some quotes from a remarkable little book. If you haven't read it, uh, here's a plug for it. <laughs> Ideas Have Consequences by Richard Weaver. Uh, I, I, you won't be disappointed, I don't think. Listen to a moment what he says about this. Quote, whoever argues for a restoration of values is sooner or later met with the objection that one cannot return, or, as the phrase is likely to be, you can't turn the clock back. By thus assuming that we are prisoners of the moment, the objection well reveals the philosophic position of modernism. The believer, in truth, on the other hand, is bound to maintain that the things of highest value are not affected by the passage of time. Otherwise, the very concept of truth becomes impossible. In declaring that we wish to recover lost ideals and values, we are looking toward an ontological realm which is timeless. Only the sheerest relativism insists that passing time renders unattainable one ideal while forcing upon us another. Therefore, those who say that we can have the integration we wish and those who say we cannot differ in their ideas of ultimate reality, for the latter are positing the primacy of time and matter. This wisdom may be applied, I believe, to the decisions regarding the sacred liturgy which were in vogue, or rather at the boiling point, in the 1960s. The church must find a language to speak to modern man, said the experts. Modern man was never defined, except in the negative, as someone who is unable to understand the past, someone who was a product of the Enlightenment, that is, someone who could not stomach mystery. All must be explained, all must be understood immediately, down with Latin. But this was an error and Weaver was right, that the things of the highest value are not affected by the passage of time. So I speak to you as someone who looks toward an ontological realm which is timeless. Weaver continues, now the return which the idealist proposed is not a voyage backward through time, but rather a return to center, which must be conceived metaphysically or theologically. They are speaking the one which in, of the one which endures and not the many which change and pass. And this search can only be described as looking for the truth. They are making the ancient affirmation that there is a center of things, and they point out that every feature of modern disintegration is a flight from this toward periphery. It is expressible also as a movement from unity to individualism. In proportion as man approaches the outer rim, 
he becomes lost in details, and the more he is preoccupied with details, the less he can understand them. A recovery of understanding as such, and this, unless we admit ourselves to be helpless in the movement of a deterministic march, this is possible at any time. In brief, one does not require a particular standpoint to comprehend the timeless. Let us remember all the while that the very notion of eternal verities is repugnant to the modern temper. So if you are here at this conference, it is likely that you are not bound by endless details or bound by the prison of time and matter, but rather you seek the truth of things at the center. And the very notion of eternal verities is not repugnant to you, but rather it is delicious. I doubt I need spend much time, if any, trying to persuade you that the very notion of eternal verities may be found in the right of St. Gregory the Great. Technicians of the liturgy may bristle at the phrase that the French usually call the old mass. That is, if you go to France, you'll hear normally two phrases to describe the old mass. One is uh, the Mass de saint pie the, the Mass of St. Pius V, and the other is la Mass de Toujours, the Mass of Always, or the Immemorial Mass, the Mass of All Times. Uh, experts may bristle at it, but I like that moniker. I find it accurate. Another thing which ought to be said at the outset is to criticize the architects of the new Mass insofar as they were impious. When Plato wrote in the Laws, quote, let parents then bequeath to their children not the riches, but the spirit of reverence, he was writing in a tradition of Western education which insists that children ought to be taught to despise what is despicable and to ridicule what is ridiculous to admire what is admirable, to respect what is venerable. The opposite of veneration for what our ancestors strove to hand down to us is, of course, impiety. And it is significant that when Plato discusses the nature of, in, of piety and impiety, he chooses a young man, Euthyphro, who is bent on patricide. He is a youth filled with arrogant knowledge, and he is certain that he understands, quote, what is dear to the gods. He has come to Athens in order to prosecute his own father for murder. Socrates is struck by this, and he begins to question him as in the usual fashion as he usually does. And they come to the conclusion that Euthyphro has no right, because of his partial and immature knowledge, to proceed against an ancient relationship. But the architects of the Novus Ordo did proceed against an ancient relationship and with a vengeance. The desire, for example, of Archbishop Anibali Bunini to remove the sign of the cross from the mass because it was too heavy with symbolism, that ought to make us shudder. Just the idea of it. We should be horrified by such a thought. They had a partial and immature knowledge of liturgy, according to Father Louis Bouillet, who was on the original commission that decided these things. The operative approach to things liturgical was a scientized clinical approach, but Bouillet criticized it. He said this scientized approach is never scientific enough. And as to relying on the historical critical approach to theology, be it redaction criticism or form criticism or whatever, I believe strongly that many of their conclusions were based on a hypothesis that was founded on a theory which was based on a guess. Not very solid. Now why this animus against the past? Why did they have this? Let me use Weaver again. Quote, Most modern people appear to resent the past and seek to deny its substance for either of two reasons. One, it confuses them, or two, it inhibits them. If it confuses them, they have not thought enough about it. If it inhibits them, we should look with a curious eye upon whatever schemes they have afoot. Imagination enables us to know that people of past generations lived and had their being amidst circumstances just as solid as those surrounding us. 
and piety accepts them, their words and deeds, as part of the total reality, not to be ignored in any summing up of experience. Indeed, some are confused by the traditional requiem. I once celebrated <clears throat> a solemn high mass uh, in the traditional rite of requiem. And after mass, we had gone out, of, escorted, of course, the deceased out, out to the hearse, and uh, the casket was in. There was a little bit of milling about, and I heard this lady in a, in a rather loud voice, well, I didn't understand a thing that little priest was saying, the little priest referring to me. <laughs> and without turning around, the deacon uh, who, who was at that mass, I heard him respond by saying, oh, that's okay, ma'am. He wasn't talking to you. <laughs> um, that was a pretty good comeback, a little rough, but, but accurate, uh, again. So perhaps with what is being written and said about the old rites in our times, such as this conference, will, will further dispel some of that confusion. I certainly hope so. Uh, just a little aside, it seems to me, uh, uh, and this is hopefully not taken as a shameless plug to the little book I wrote, but um, I looked and looked and looked for a little book. Isn't there some book that can just take you through the Mass, sort of start to finish, and explain the basic parts, why we do this, how come the priest does that? And I couldn't find such a book. You can find the things in all different kinds of areas, but not just one little book. So uh, uh, that's why uh, I wrote it. And as I was going through a lot of these sources, what I discovered is a lot of the writings, you can find some gems, some real wisdom in things, say, written in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and whatnot. But a lot of these scholars, you could, between the lines, it was though they couldn't wait to get rid of this mass. I mean, they were champing at the bit. And so their approach often was, in my mind, was, okay, we know this mass is bad. But why is it bad? Now there's all kinds of things being written and have been written for some time. Okay, we know this Mass is beautiful, but why is it beautiful? And if you could say a little prayer uh, for me, it's, uh, it's coming along. I want to do the same thing, only with the, all the rites of matrimony, starting with the rite of betrothal, would be a second book, uh, going clear up to the nuptial Mass and the nuptial blessing and all of that. So I think that'll meet a need, because again, I can't find a book that just takes you through uh, and comments on all those things. But back to the subject, as to the past inhibiting, and the past does inhibit, to that I would say long may it reign. Indeed, it does inhibit the priest, the choir, and everything that goes along with it. You can't do any old thing you want. The priest is not in charge, uh, really. Uh, the mass is in charge his responsibility and everybody else to do what Holy Mother Church uh, has told us to do. The Mass is not mine, the Mass is not yours. It has been given to us, bequeathed as a precious inheritance. Now to understand the Requiem a little bit deeper, what would that being said, I wish to begin with some basic principles of prayer, because when you go to Mass, anybody that goes to the traditional Mass, maybe the first time, at least will recognize well, they're praying. Uh, that's something that's going on here. I might not understand all of that. I can't understand what that little priest was saying, but okay, he's praying. There's praying that's going. So let's go into some basics of prayer. St. Pius X once said, the greatest prayer of the church is the Roman office, the mass. The second greatest is the divine office, the breviary. And the third greatest is the people's office, or the Holy Rosary. So. Here are some basic principles of prayer. If prayer is seen in its true light, it will appear as a line of communication, which we must keep open between ourselves and God. It is a channel through which our love flows to God and God's love back to us. But love is often beyond our capacity to put into words. The wordlessness of love is a regular occurrence between lovers. So, in the rite of St. Gregory on the whole, there is no overemphasis or over-reliance upon words. The words are there, 
but so is much silence. And the thought that someone must be talking or singing the whole Mass is foreign to the traditional Mass, and I would say is foreign to love. Our Lord said as much, quote, and when you are praying, speak not much, as the heathens. They think that in their much speaking they may be heard. Uh, quoted from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 7. Our good Lord was not saying that long prayers are bad, or that prayers with many words are bad. What he was saying was emphasizing it's our minds and our hearts rather than the tongue and the mouth. Those are the basic organs of prayer, the mind and the heart. And we should often recall that one single moment in which we have thought of God exclusively, the thought of him with love and gratitude, the thought of him with submissiveness to his will or with repentance for our sins, one such moment is likely far more pleasing to God than our many words. Furthermore, we need to pray attente ac devote, with attention and devotion. These two words are from a prayer, which is said before reciting the divine office. But prayer is not nullified by the involuntary distractions which plague us all. The human mind is often like a, the instability of a little child, restless, squirming, running from one thing to another, incapable of the sustained effort which prayer demands. But our prayer is still acceptable to God, nay, very acceptable, even if we spend the whole time of prayer doing nothing but brushing away distractions. If we have made a good intention and given an honest effort to complete the intention, then our prayer is good. And more to the point of right intention is the fact that prayer is a duty. It's a matter of justice. God wants us to pray. From this basic understanding, we see immediately how foolish it would be for anyone to excuse himself from prayer because he doesn't feel like praying. Prayer is not a matter of mood any more than it is a matter of convenience. And we cannot justify a lack of prayer by the absence of feeling or that we do not seem to get anything out of prayer. We do not pray because we're going to get something. We pray because God wants us to since prayer is something we do primarily for God. And we must be on our guard against prayer becoming self-centered, that its themes and movements revolve around us instead of God, that marvelous image that Judge Revis was saying last night of, uh, was it Rodin? The sculptor with the, the thinker, you know, just closed in on himself, can't, the, the rest of the world doesn't matter, it's, it's just him, that's not prayer have to be on our guard against this. The glory of the Mass says this when we pray, we give thee thanks because of thy great glory. That's why we're doing it. Because of thy great glory. We thank God not for what he has done or what he will do for us, but because of who he is. If the majority of our prayers are the, are the prayers of petition, asking God for favors for ourselves or others, and only occasional prayers are reserved for adoration, contrition, or gratitude, then the time we give to prayer is unbalanced. Our wants and desires should not take precedence over God and over his glory. The Pater Noster is a perfect example of this. It's a very adult prayer, isn't it? That is, if you give a gift to a child, they normally do not resort immediately to gratitude. I, for example, I, I can remember, we had a family, a tradition that at Christmas, everybody, you open up one gift at a time, and it goes around. And so uh, take my oldest nephew, it was his turn, and before being told, you know, it's your turn, he was already up in the papers, just tearing into the gift and whatnot, and, you know, he rips open the box, ah, a fully automatic M16, great. <laughs> So, you know, he starts to get it out, and uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he, you know, he, get, he gets a, the toy and starts to play, and his mother would say, well, now, who is that from, John? Well, I don't know. Well, there's a tag on there that tells you who it's from. Oh, says it's from Uncle Jim. What do you say to Uncle Jim? Well, thanks, Uncle Jim. And then goes on 
playing with the toy, right? Very different from my mom. May she rest in peace. I could have a rock in a cardboard box <laughs> and hold it out. Oh, you shouldn't have. Immediately, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> All that, so the gratitude comes down. That's far more adult, isn't it, than of the child. So you see the difference. In the Potter Noster, the thanks is first. And then you get to what you need. So the Requiem Mass, it's another thing you'll notice about it. It's a very adult prayer. With those general principles being said, let me go into some particulars. That is, if you go to the traditional Requiem, you're going to experience several things at once, and though not necessarily in any particular order. The first of these is the presentation of a number of ceremonies using various instruments, gestures, and clothing. This is because much of what we see and hear at a requiem is meant for the living. We, and we are not angels. Knowledge comes through the senses. So the senses must be addressed. St. Augustine says the following in his great work, The City of God, quote, All this, that is the preparing of the bodies, the kind of burying, the pomp of funerals, is rather a consolation for the living than a help for the dead. The bodies of the dead must not be treated with disrespect or thrown away, especially those who have died in innocence and faith, because the Holy Ghost used these members like so many organs and vessels to do his work. If, therefore, our Father's ring or clothes or things of that kind are dear and cherished according to our love for him, for the same reason these bodies are to be honored. They are nearer and united to us more closely than the clothes we wear. For our bodies are not an ornament or as an aid to us, but these bodies belong to the nature of man. Hence, the funerals of the great and just men of old were considered as works of piety, and their burials celebrated. While they lived, they chose the place of their tomb. They told their children how their bodies were to be carried. Tobias, burying the dead, merited heaven according to the words of the angel, while the gospel tells us with what care and honor they placed in the tomb of the body of the Lord. Surely all this signifies not that there is in any sense, not that there is any sense in the dead body, but that by the providence of God, who is pleased by these works of mercy, these ceremonies tell of the faith in the resurrection from the dead. And all these ceremonies are the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. Christ said explicitly he did not come to destroy it, he came to fulfill it. So his priesthood is not in the order of Levi or Aaron, but the order of Melchizedek, the high priest and king of Salem, who gave the original blessing to Abraham, the movements of the priests in the temple of Solomon, the incense, the psalms, all you see has its origin in Jewish practice but not the offering of animals, rather being present in a liturgical way at the immolation of Christ on Calvary. This is the first purpose of every requiem, to adore the Father in spirit and in truth, and to thank him for creating the deceased for whom the Mass is being said, to thank the Son for redeeming him, and to thank the Holy Ghost for sanctifying him. The benefit to the living is not just for their consolation, of course, it is also to awaken in the minds of those present at the ceremonies the belief in the resurrection of the dead on the last day, and above all to pray for the repose of the souls of the faithful departed and their speedy delivery from purgatory. The second thing that might be experienced is reverence. Reverence is a word from the Latin language. Judge Reverence was talking about deponent verbs the other night. And this is another depont reverior. It's one of the Latin words for fear. And so it, it's deponent verbs describe an action. It happens to you, and it's also something that you do simultaneously. The altar, the missal, the crucifix, all the holy things are given reverence, at the heart of which is fearing to harm someone or something that you love. Thus we give the utmost human respect to the mortal remains of the deceased because his body was a temple of the Holy Ghost by virtue of his baptism. So we fear to harm it in any way. A third thing experienced is the doctrine that the soul, once created by God, is not destroyed, but rather 
changed in a sense. This is said in the preface of the Mass, vita mutatur, non tolitur, life is changed, not ended. It's in the preface of the Mass for the dead. And this is symbolized in the candles around the coffin. That is, what you want to have when the coffin is there and the funeral pall is over it. There are six candles on either side of the deceased, and these are of unbleached wax, as opposed to the bleached wax up on the altar. The candles on the altar of bleached wax, that represents the church of the living. That's the church militant. That's you and me. And we're bleached. We don't see each other as we truly are. Thank you. Couldn't bear it. Yeah. For one thing, we have clothes on. And that's a blessing. But uh, the... Uh, the deceased, however, that's, those are unbleached candles because now he is appearing for God as he truly is. No bleach, no covering of any kind. Naked I came into this world, naked shall I leave it. And so that experience, and it's almost as if the, the flame that comes from the unbleached candle is slightly different than the flame on the altar. Vita mutatu, non toli, life has changed, not entered, like a slightly different flame now. Fourth, the use of black, the traditional Jewish and Western color of death. We live in an age, of course, which seeks to repress the cardinal emotion of sadness. If someone is sad, many in our times feel driven to cheer them up and not let them be sad. You've got to cheer up. You need to be happy. But before Jerusalem was destroyed, Christ wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. He wept. <coughs> there is a time to mourn. There is a time to weep, says the book of Ecclesiastes. Yet, as St. Paul says, not as the pagans do, as those who have no hope. On the tabernacle, however, the veil is not black, but purple, since our Lord lives, to symbolize the sorrow of the Savior at the death of one of his own. And the altar cloths remain white, which is a symbol of his resurrection and ascension. A fifth thing, we pray for the dead. This ancient tradition is so well exemplified by the Maccabees and the sacrifices that they had ensured in the temple to be said for their fallen comrades, and it is carried on to this day. This practice of praying for the dead assumes, therefore, that there is a purgatory. Now, to illustrate the Catholic doctrine of purgatory, I'm going to turn to Dr. Samuel Johnson, a very famous Protestant man of letters. If you're not familiar with Dr. Johnson. He has some very good apologetics for the Catholic faith and Catholic practices. One of them was, uh, for example, guardian angels. And his biographer, James Boswell, once asked him, for example, what proof have you, sir, of guardian angels? And he said, why drones, sir, and little boys. That's the proof. It's an eloquent reply. Regarding then the subject of purgatory, their short exchange went like this. Boswell, what do you think, sir, of purgatory is believed by the Roman Catholics? Johnson, why, sir, it is a very harmless doctrine. They are of the opinion that the generality of mankind are neither so obstinately wicked as to deserve everlasting punishment, nor so good as to merit being admitted into the society of blessed spirits, and therefore God is graciously pleased to allow of a middle state where they may be purified by certain degrees of suffering. You see, sir, there is nothing unreasonable in this. Boswell. But then, sir, there are masses for the dead. Johnson. Why, sir, if it be once established that there are souls in purgatory, it is as proper to pray for them as for the brethren of mankind who are yet in this life. A sixth thing, in keeping with the principle that Dr. Johnson elucidated, the traditional Latin requiem does not judge. It does not say, either in the texts or anywhere, that the deceased was a saint, or saintly, or in heaven. It does not say, either in the texts or anywhere, that he was bad, or that he was evil, or that he's in hell. Now, the sermon is a different matter. I know a priest um, actually was in this diocese. I won't <coughs> say his name, but um, uh, he became more and more irritated about the person, the man for whom he was <laughs> celebrating the funeral mass until at one point in the sermon he simply exploded. His faculties for preaching, by the way, 
uh, th those were removed by uh, uh, Bishop Gerber. And at one point he just, he just said, uh, that pointing to the cask, he said, you know, he was a son of a biscuit. <laughs> and I say biscuit lest I scandalize Father McElwain. But, um, you know, it's very, very improper, uh, to, to say the least. Uh, not a good approach to take in the sermon, regardless of its, of its uh, veracity. But the old mass makes no such judgments. It simply says the deceased was a human being affected by original sin, offered salvation by Christ. And there is no mention of whether or not he received that redemption or salvation. And therefore, we behave with great solemnity, not with statements that we cannot possibly know, such as, we know he's in a better place. We don't say those kind of things. We only say that the departed is in the hands of God, and that God is the only one that can judge with perfect justice and perfect mercy. Seventh, there is no judgment of the deceased, but much hope for him, in that we trust God will do what is best for him. And this hope has a firm basis. And it is not the good things that he did in his life. Our hope is based instead on what our blessed Lord did for him as no man can justify himself before God. Our hope is also founded on the resurrection. The resurrection is a definitive victory over sin and death. In Christ, the second Adam, mankind has passed from death to spiritual resurrection, to sonship, to grace, to participation in the life of the three divine persons. Christ rose for us and has now established the bridge to heaven and leads us on after him to the Eternal Father. This is not to say that judgment is never addressed. It is addressed powerfully in the sequence of the Mass, in the Dies Irae. The Dies Irae, which was dropped from the new funeral, right, can hardly be translated with its splendor and sublimity since poetry is always lost in translation, as Robert Frost once said. The author of it is not known for sure. It dates somewhere in from the 13th century. <laughs> Perhaps it was written in that century by a saint who was filled with heavenly perfection such that he did not want any recognition for his work. It could be argued that it is the finest piece of poetry ever composed by man. I've heard that argument in more than one place, and I'm inclined to agree with that. The secret of its power lies in the awful grandeur of its theme the intense earnestness and pathos of the poet, the simple majesty and solemn muse of its language, the stately meter, the triple rhyme, producing an effect as if we heard the final crash of the universe, the commotion of the graves opened, the trumpet of the archangel summoning the quick and the dead, and saw, quote, the king of tremendous majesty, seated on his throne of justice and mercy, ready to dispense everlasting life or everlasting woe. The importance of addressing the judgment cannot be overestimated, in my opinion. I remember a good Catholic woman, this is some years ago, who was an employee of a diocese, not this one, and she had a position that she was required to assist parishes with very, very difficult pastoral problems. She was called to a rural parish to assist with consequences of a car accident, wherein four high school girls who were traveling, uh, coming home from a football game at night, they hit head on another car with two passengers. Everyone was killed. One of the girls was a Catholic, and apparently really a lovely girl, just a cheerleader, straight A student, devout Catholic and all of that. <laughs> so the priest asked for some help on this. He was a young priest, and they determined to put together a program for the funeral. And often with these masses, you have a program. She showed me the program and wanted my opinion on it. Of course, one needs to be pastoral or kind at such a moment. Um, but, uh, of course, I was quite tempted to accommodate a line from a wonderful film called The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, that when, so that when she showed me the program, I, what I wanted to say is, programs? Quito Nino's thinking programs. I mean, that's 
what I wanted to say, but I did. Anyway, I began to point out a few things. That is, let's start with the songs. The songs were cho chosen ditties, such as, you know, Eagle's Wings? I don't know. Um, yeah. um, and then everything about it ignored <coughs> death, sin, judgment, purgatory, repentance, amendment of life, etc., etc., etc. None of those things were covered. And the sermon was to the effect that the priest didn't know what to say until the girl's little sister said that she knew her sister was in heaven. So this is the happiest day of my life, because now I know my sister is in heaven. So let's make this a celebration of her life. And so that's what the sermon was about. Now, the problem, one problem at least with this approach, which I think is fairly typical in our times, is that the thorny questions of sin and death and judgment, they don't go away. And they just sit there on the back burner with young people, smoldering, burning. They still have the questions. The questions aren't addressed. But if they can't find those addressed in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass or the texts or, or anyway, they'll go looking somewhere else to try and find them. If we repress these questions, we do a great disservice to any youth who attends such a celebration. And so they're going to find somewhere else to get an answer to their very legitimate questions about these subjects. And they are likely to come away from those other sources with many errors about death, such as all that is required to go to heaven is just to die. If you die, you're going to a better place. That's it. An eighth thing. The faith contained in the Requiem Mass is a gentle belief, an understated belief in how God acts. Pope Benedict XVI once wrote, it is part of the mystery of God that he acts gently, that he only gradually builds up his history within the great history of mankind, that he chooses to come to mankind only through the faith of the disciples to whom he revealed himself, that he continues to knock gently at the doors of our heart and slowly opens our eyes if we open our doors to him. And is this not the truly divine way, not to overwhelm with external power, but to give freedom, to offer and elicit love. If we attend to the witnesses with listening hearts and open ourselves to the signs by which the Lord again and again authenticates both him, uh, authenticates himself, then we know <coughs> that he is truly risen. So the Requiem Mass I would say, is a gentle knocking at the doors of our hearts to entrust ourselves to the risen Lord. Christ has saved us in principle by his death and resurrection, and we can be opened to his power by our living faith. As St. Paul put it, whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. St. Thomas the Apostle went all the way to recognizing Christ's divinity. For Jesus said to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Ninth, once the prayers over the catafalque or the coffin are finished, the in paradisum is sung. This too was dropped, sadly. It's a gorgeous hymn. May the angels guide thee into paradise. May the martyrs receive thee on thy journey and lead thee into the holy city, Jerusalem. May the choirs of angels take thee, and with Lazarus, once poor, may you have everlasting rest. Sums up everything, the wishes of the priest who celebrates the Mass, the faithful who are attending it. This is what we hope. Thus the last prayer said for the departed, before, that is said, the last time, right before the last time he goes <coughs> through the doors of his parish church. That's it. It is a perfect expression of hope. It is the nature of hope to be convinced that the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary, at which we are present during the funeral mass, would make salvation possible for the departed. One of the fruits of the sacrifice may then be seen at the cemetery, in a cemetery of consecrated ground, you will see the sign of salvation, the cross. The cemeteries and burial places of all other religions are like those of the pagans. No cross, 
No signs of salvation mark the resting place of their dead. Their monuments and tombstones are today like those on the banks of the Nile or along the roads leading out of Rome, around the site of ancient Athens, the deserts of Arabia, monuments of human folly and pride. While the church alone surrounds her funeral rites with signs, figures, and symbols teaching truth to living and guarding the remains of the dead. The word cemetery is from the Greek, meaning a sweet station, a place of rest or sleep for those who die in the peace with God and go to a sweet station or place on their way to the last judgment, awaiting their rising. The origin of the practice of the cemetery may be found in the burial of Abraham, who brought the double cave, who bought the double cave, this is in Genesis chapter 23, verse 9, where his bones were laid, and there was buried Sarah, and there slept the bones of Isaac, of Jacob, of Adam, and of Eve. We do not bury indifferently inside the church or in the cemetery. The condition of a person at his death, his station or wealth, or the importance of his family should not be the cause of his monument in a consecrated ground, but only his good life or his holiness. St. Augustine says, quote, those who being oppressed by grievous sins procure that their bodies at death be placed in consecrated ground should be condemned for their audacity, and the holy place will not deliver them but will accuse them of the guilt of temerity. Those who are buried in a church are martyrs or great defenders of their country. Of ecclesiastics, only bishop and founders of orders should be buried in the church. And one last thing uh, with which I will conclude. There's a practice in the <laughs> traditional Roman rite that always makes any priest uh, feel that his collar is a little bit tight. And the practice is, is that the faithful departed are debased, are buried facing the east, so that at the last judgment they will rise up to the Son of God who is facing the east. Priests are always buried uh, facing the west. Did you know this, Father? Yeah. Did you know this? Oh, well, good, you're in the right place. You yeah. get to know why. You see, at the very end, um, the priest is based during facing the West because when he rises, he will have to face his congregation and answer to them as to how he did as a priest. So pray for your poor priest that they can answer well. Thank you. see why he's my hero. Uh, and I'll be uh, officiating at a, at a, a funeral, here, not directly mass, but funeral for uh, General Alvishan here shortly. So uh, once again, I ask you to, to pray for him, for his family. This building is uh, architectural proof of maxim of G.K. Chesterton, which said, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a poor building that you can run across. Uh, it leaks, and um, the electricity doesn't work right, and the heating and cooling don't work right, and the water is tainted, and it's, it's, it's a bad place. Um, but at the same time, it's a place of romance not just the romance of students who meet each other here and who perhaps fall in love and, and uh, marry and have children. And that's happened numerous times in the history of this place, despite its architecture. But it is a place in which our heart can speak to other hearts and in which our heart can speak to God, which is what prayer is all about. What I'd like to do now uh, is to tell you a story about when I was riding my bicycle across Kansas, I remember pulling into a town called St. John's, and, and it wasn't really the town, it was a farmhouse as I rolled out of town, and it was about 108 degrees that day, it was very hot, very tired, and there was a lady who was in the farmhouse, and she came out with a glass of water, and it was probably the best beverage I've ever had in my life. 
Sam Adams notwithstanding. Um, I don't think I've ever tasted anything as, as glorious as that drink of water she gave me that day when I was on my bicycle. I mention that because not too long ago, I was in a parish in the state close to this one, in which I had endured, I fill in for priests on weekends, and I had endured a horrible uh, liturgy and choir, and on uh, eagle's wings was good compared to the stuff I was listening to. And I was driving back to Topeka, Kansas, thinking to myself, you know, how can people even go to church hearing that stuff they, they have? I'm not sure my faith is that strong. I think I've had to listen to that. I don't know. I stay home and watch NASCAR or something. I don't know. Seriously? And, and I was in, in spiritually kind of very dry and desperate. And then I pulled into um, I was Pure Heart of Mary Church in Topeka. And there I heard a children's choir. And I heard a children's choir that um, somebody says that to me and I immediately tense up and I think, oh Lord, well, is this going to be like that? <laughs> and what I heard was, came straight from the angels and from heaven itself. It was an absolutely wonderful experience. And that was thanks to this, those who were singing, um, but that was also thanks to our next speaker, Dr. Tappan. So, Doctor, I think you're here now, and I didn't have a chance to tell you that Sunday how important that experience was for me, but I tell you now publicly that that was a wonderful experience, uh, and he's going to talk about a topic that uh, came to me as a surprise, and as a delightful surprise, when he said he wanted to talk about music and the formation of moral imagination. So, um, Dr. Tappan, I turn it over to you, sir. Thank you so much for all you've done for so many 